Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin in this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word together. We invite your spirit's presence to instruct us, to teach us, to guide us as we continue to unfold our history and the significance of the book of Judges in our time. And we just pray, Lord, that uh, the Holy Spirit can correct any errors we may have in our understanding and help us to lay out these lines in a way that can be understood by all in this message and all who are searching for truth. We pray for each person. May your angels watch over and protect them. May your Holy Spirit speak to their hearts. And may you help us uh, in our day-to-day -day lives as we interact with others. Help us to have the meekness and lowliness of Christ. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So uh, yesterday we had dealt uh, quite a bit with the chronology, um, some of the chronology problems that we have in understanding how uh, a period of time can be uh, symbolic and even rounded off periods of time are symbolic, um, even if they're not exact. So we were dealing with the 300 years. And we, we found from Stephen's study of the judges that it has to be more than 300 years, yet um, let's just round it down. And Ellen White's 300 years is also uh, should be understood as being rounded, uh, rounded down, that it would be actually a longer period than 300 years. Ellen White rounds up the number on the ship in Acts 27 as 300. And we know that 300 is this symbol that relates to uh, this movement in relation to uh, the July 18, 2020 prediction. Um, that that is uh, a symbol that uh, relates to the Sunday law. And so there's lots of different things that, that, that we have um, come to understand about how these periods of time work. One thing that we do believe is that we can, with all of the spans of time given us, that we can understand uh, the correct dates in reality, that these aren't just symbolic. So we don't believe that there's a symbolic significance of the dates in the Bible, but no basis in reality. We believe there's a basis in reality and that we can, we have shown this in many different ways, um, <clears throat> that we can anchor these dates in reality. Now, now Stephen's here. He wasn't here yesterday. Uh, Stephen, did you watch the video from yesterday? Yes. Uh, did you have any corrections for us? Um, there was maybe just a, a few points, maybe I, I sort of um, wasn't maybe taking notes to make corrections, but uh, I sort of, there's a few things maybe I could add to it, but. Um, okay, well, I, <clears throat> I can bring up the diagram, because that, I mean, is that the issue with how we were understanding the, <clears throat> this diagram? Mm -hmm. Right, so there's nothing um, hard and fast with this here. It's kind of uh, just something, a scene that uh, I was sort of playing around with this here 18-year period of the Ammonite and uh, Philistine oppression. Yeah. And I'm trying to work out, can, can it be pinned down? But I don't think it can, but... It could happen actually that this year, eighteen year portion, uh, is within that forty year period, or it could right. Be... That's what we were uncertain about. This, this, the beginning and the ending of this. Yes. Right, but this three hundred and nineteen years—that's just—that's sort of solid, right? Well, I, I would say it's there's overlap within that time period. Oh, you think there is overlap? 
where where would the overlap be? Um, I tend to think maybe Ehud, the eighty years there. Okay. Ellen White doesn't. Ellen White doesn't really uh, say anything about it. Also, she doesn't say anything about the eighteen years before with uh, Eglon. So Eglon, um, and we don't have anything that we can absolutely uh, lay that down. Um. Because we have Othniel, then we have, it says Eglon, Eglon. Well, in the Bible, it says Eglon for 18 years, right? Yes, and he, he heard it says that the land rested for 80, for 80 years. So it doesn't yeah. maybe say that. I don't know whether he heard continued to live th that whole time period, but uh, he may have done. Okay, and then Jabin um, is... Years. That's yes, well, El Mike confirms that as well. Uh, the the album date to twenty years, and that the forty years after that, she speaks yeah. about it. You know, um, yeah. so um, just if you are going to add that, the hundred nineteen years, then it's going to be there's the period then with Joshua, and the elders that outlived Joshua, uh, prior to that. So the 300 years uh, that we find there in Judges 11, 26 could actually probably be, you know, could be nearer 350. And okay. then, you have, then you have Eli, 40 years there. Where do you put him? Where do you put the long, but, uh, the long life that mm -hmm. uh, Samuel lived? I know. We're not told, is, not told exactly. But, but we're going to have a period that's going to be longer than 396 years. So I'm kind of uh, tend to think there has to be somewhere over, somewhere there that's not specified where there's overlap. Right. So, so when we look at this period of time then here, we can say these are the years that are given to us. And even if these are, are, are overlapping, they still represent this symbolically i think we can do that yes which is kind of the point that we were making is that um we have periods and if you know if we take these periods and add them up they give us this number 319 which of course is an iteration of 391 and then we also have uh two periods of 66 years that can be worked in there on either end, and then the 187 years. So this is much more a symbolic representation of that time, but not a literal representation. Is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So so we still have a bunch of things to sort out when it comes to this chronology. But I don't know how we're going to come to a conclusion. Um, the, the thing that we do know, though, um, from looking at the, the days that the manna fell and the timing of the wave offering is that um, if we're going to place the exodus, uh, it limits us um, uh, to basically, I mean, 1533 BC has to be the year for the exodus. Yes. So other, other years aren't going to work. There's not some other way uh, to get that. And, and that agrees with 1 Kings uh, 6, verse 1, and Ellen White's statements regarding the spans of time. And now as far as the rounded off, we know Ellen White gives 300 years at the arcs in Shiloh. So we would say that that's more, right? That that's rounded down. We're not going to... Possibly, yes. Possibly, in this year case, with this diagram, yeah, I, the three hundred years would end uh, seven years after uh, uh, the Ammonite oppression of eighteen years, and then. Um, um, well, if this is well, this is three hundred nineteen years, right? Yes. This, yeah, and. Mm -hmm. Ark in Shiloh would begin at the beginning of this? Well, I'm just going by the uh, 
The organ shadow begins at the end of the six years, yes. But these and six so you, so, overlap. So you have you, so that that there's what was given there. You have the time well, you have within that time period Joshua and then the others you outlive Joshua before you have Cush Rhea Theum uh, right. again has so, depression. So, so the three hundred years you're saying would end after the time of the Philistine oppression begins, the Philistine Ammonite oppression. Yeah, so I, I understand there's a seven year time difference. If we're going to take them 300 years as exact. Okay. So that would be like a year after Jephthah. After his six oh, years. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. I don't quite get that. Because there's other diagrams I've sort of worked with out there, and uh, <clears throat> okay, so I, we're I, I'm just I'm sorry, I'm basing that on the th other the other three hundred years. So you have the the three hundred years from when they be began to dwell in Heshbon, yeah, until until the end of that eighteen year period. But you're taking that as an actual period then of three hundred years, or are you taking it as rounded? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm just I'm just taking it just as it is, and then yeah. seeing what seeing what it comes with comes to. So yeah. it may not be exactly that what it is. Yeah, um, I I still, I still think that these three hundred year periods, both Ellen White's and the Bibles, are rounded down. But then, see, I have a different view on how we deal with Eli and Samuel, and 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 that period because. But yeah, we're going to have to sort that out somehow. I don't know. Because um, we're going to have to go through, well, we're going to have to go through your paper before we get to the camp meeting. We're going to have to go through that as a group. Right, okay. Uh, you know, some way. So whether we do it like on a, a Friday night study or when it, whenever we do it, um, maybe in the morning studies again. Um, yeah, well, my, your Friday nights wouldn't really suit my... Yeah, that's right, the Friday night wouldn't sleep, sleep pattern. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. So it'd have to be like uh, a Sabbath afternoon or Sunday afternoon or something. I don't know. Yes. Or, or, or in the morning. But, I mean, either way, you, you, you'll always have an inconvenience of studying with us. So... I mean, we could do it at uh, midnight, you know, uh, that would work for you in the morning. But... So anyway, so so we dealt with that problem, and I want to deal with another problem today. So whether we're going to get any of these problems sorted out completely, I don't know. But uh, the one thing that I want to look at is um, judges – Chapter one. So uh, we, we talked about this just briefly yesterday, but we're saying that Judges 1 1 is a symbol of the first day of the first month. Now, it's interesting how these two chapters, chapter one and chapter two, are sort of laid out because it's going to talk about now after the death of Joshua, right? Now, when you go to chapter two, it's going to talk about the death of Joshua again, right? And, and this is where it's going to tell us that Joshua died, right? So, um, and how old he was in Judges 2, verse 8. And, and um, so, you know, we have to figure out why, why it's arranged this way and what this in particular means. Um, Now, it's also going to tell us this in Joshua 24, 29 to 30, right? So it's it's basically going to tell us the same information in Judges chapter 2 that it tells us at the end of the book of Joshua. Uh, basically, it uh, looks like it's exactly the same. Yeah, so it's just basically quoting that. Um, but why is it placed like this? So, so we're going to go through and read these two chapters again, and 
and try to sort out what's actually happening. So in Judges 1, 1, it says, Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. And Judah said unto Simeon his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I like Wise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him, and Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. And we addressed that number 10,000 before. And uh, what was the significance of the number 10,000? Does anybody remember? It's 27.3 years. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Um, and um, also, if we divided it by 360, it ends up being 27 years and uh, 280 days so uh, but it was the 27.3 I think is what we use so it's 27.3 years and um, so that was a symbol uh, that we had and I think we also put it as a span of time uh, where we could where we could actually mark it so if I remember correctly um, uh, so yes, if we counted from um, November ninth, two thousand nineteen, right? So from the time of the end and we count 10,000 days, it brings us to March 27th, 2017, right? So it gives us again that 273 symbol. And uh, uh, that period in uh, of, of 2017 becomes significant um, uh, relating to uh, this movement as far as uh, organization, right? So that's when uh, the movement's going to begin to organize. So there's a lot tied to there. So uh, so when we look at this, this period of time here, this that, that's being marked, we say Judges 1-1 is marking September 11th, right? That is, it's marking the first day of the first month, which can be September 11th. And, but we have this period of time, which we would count from, November 9th, and we know the connection between 11-9 and 9-11, both with 11-9 in 1989 and 9-11 in 2001, and 11-9 in 2019 and 9-11. Now, the way that I would look at this is when we talk about 11-9 in 1989, um, that's going to relate to 9-11 as being the empowerment of the first angel. When we talk about 11-9 in 9, 2019 and its relationship to 9-11, that's going to be referring to 9-11 as the arrival of the second angel. Does that not make sense to anyone, what I said? Everybody understand that? Just say it again, please. Okay. I'm, I'm going to draw this because I think it's an important point. And... Um, 
because I think it's one of the main things that uh, we've come to understand, but I'm not sure how clearly we understand it. Stop the share there. Okay. So obviously we have eleven nine here in nineteen eighty nine, and we have nine eleven, but we also have eleven nine over here. So this is 2001, uh, 2019. Okay, so we see those quite clearly. Now, we know that we actually have two 9-11s. So this is the time of the end, and this is the first angel in power, obviously, of 1996 in here. And we know that this is the second angel. Now, we had come to understand that the book of Judges is a zoom into this way mark. That is, when we look at our history in the book of Judges, we're zooming into this. Now, the problem that Jeff had when he, he tried to bring these two together, you can bring them together. But in doing so, you actually have two different lines. That is, this line here that has this as the empowerment um, has to have the arrival of the second angel as being the Sunday law. But we know that 9-11 first is understood as the empowerment of the first angel, but this is going to align with August 11th, 1840. And so we, in a sense, have two different histories, right? Because this is going to be April 19th, 1844. So we have these two different histories that line up with 9-11. Now, we came to understand that what we could simply do is that we could take that line that Jeff has. So he's going to have this. He's going to have midnight, midnight cry, Sunday line, right? So this is kind of a separate line. Um, so try not to get that confused. So if you're looking at this as being the empowerment then this being the arrival, B911, has to be actually this date, 119. That is, if we're talking about this being the empowerment, that 911 then is this history. So what we have done is we've just taken 911 and we said that. When we look at 9-11 as the arrival of the second, it's actually a separate line because in some ways, 9-11 is going to be followed by Midnight, Midnight Cry, Sunday Law, right? So we take all of this and we place it here as this history that precedes midnight. This is our line right now. It's all about 9-11 as being the arrival of the second angel, but it's connected to this line. That is, this line here is going to end prior to midnight. That is, our history right now is still preceding midnight. 
Did, did I make that make sense? Any questions about that? I know I moved all these things around. Make sense? Anybody have problems with it? So the uh, the logic for so that's eleven. The second angel arriving, you have lined up then with uh, November nine, right, twenty nineteen. Oh. Right. So what I'm saying is that when we talked about the second angel coming down at 9-11, when we zoom into that, it's actually a, it's a different line. That line that we're zooming into is the history from 9-11 to the end of our history. That is the end of this movement, right? However, we're going to mark that, whether that's, 2023 or 2030 or something like that. I have no idea, right? We don't know when our movement ends. But we're saying that the book of Judges is a zoom into, starting at chapter two, to the arrival of the second angel at 9-11. So we created this new line, Jeff did, when we said that 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel. Because we know the arrival of the second angel is the Sunday law. And our history is about a message preparing Seventh-day Adventists for the Sunday law. So when I put 11.9 here, 11.9 is equal to 9.11. That is, this is still 9.11, but we've zoomed into it. And when we began to zoom into it in this movement, that is, when we started to recognize that 9.11 was the arrival of the second angel we actually entered into a history that is about the second angel arriving right samuel snow's letters do the same thing right his letters focus upon april 19th as uh, the arrival of the second angel but his his letters comprise the whole line that is his is a line within a line by zooming into that way mark being April 19th. And so our movement does the same thing. We zoom into 9-11, the arrival of the second angel, and we produce this typical history typifying what's going to happen in connection with the Sunday law in the future. And this to me is the primary thing that we're learning because we have a conflict in this movement where we have people who believe in the Sunday law is imminent while ignoring the fact that we haven't accomplished our task, the church is still unwarned, right? There hasn't been a warning to, to, the, to the Levites because our church is, is very much on the fringes. I mean, our movement is very much on the fringes. So we, we're not able to affect the church. So we have a work still to do, right? There's all this work to do. And, and we can see that with Samuel Snow's letters. He's, he gets them published in this minor paper uh, called The Midnight Cry. But it's not until midnight that his message is really first heard. And it's not until the midnight cry that it's empowered. And we can't say that our movement has got to either of those waymarks. We definitely haven't got to midnight yet. So that means when we're looking at this second angel arriving that Jeff talks about as being 9-11, that Jeff doesn't realize he's entering into a typical line because this bigger line still exists. And so that arrival of the second angel is not just 9-11. It's this whole history from 9-11 to 2023 or maybe up to 2030. Does that, does that help, Stephen? Uh, yes, but um, 
Mm -hmm. So we're, we're saying it's up to 2023 just based upon the number of verses in chapter 2? Yes. So we've taken chapter 2, right, because it has 23 verses. And, and we came, we jumped to this wild conclusion just right at the beginning. Once we started reading chapter two, because of this, um, the angel of the Lord coming came up from Gilgal to Bochum, right? So that's where we're going to. Uh, that was the premise. And so when we started studying judges and looking at the, the oppressions, we took the oppressions as being messages that have come in this movement since 9-11. And um, the judges being messages that countered those messages. So that's, that's the whole premise that we had in how we studied the judges. So we, we took that this, these were symbol, symbolic of years. Each verse represents a year. Not, not, you know, every verse doesn't match everything that happened in each and every year, but it represents the years. And we can definitely see how many of the verses do match. Uh, the events that happened in that year. <clears throat> so when we go to chapter one, verse one, and we have this symbol, it says now after the death of Joshua, right? So, so that's nine 11. It's going to be the first day of the first month. Now, when we go to chapter two, so what I've tried trying to determine here, it's going to talk about the je death of Joshua here. Um, in uh, Judges 2, verse 6, right? Um, and, and that's going to go all the way up to verse 10. Now, so this uh, 2006 to 2010. Now, this is a period of time in which all of these different movements began to join, these different ministries began to join uh, with uh, Jeff's movement, right? So prior to 2006, um, I mean, the first time you're even going to see Jeff connected with, with, you know, with other people, I guess, is going to be in 2004. That's going to be the Ozone Camp meeting, right? Um, and, and then we're going to have this period of time where they're going to come to understand 9-11. But when you get to 2010... It says also that also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And I'm saying that this is marking the Oklahoma camp meeting in 2010. So what happens in 2010 at the Oklahoma camp meeting? Why is that significant? Aside from the fact that I'm there for the first time. What does this verse say that aligns with the Oklahoma camp meeting? Uh, you had people joining them who didn't have the experience that Jeff had. Right. So this is, this, this is going to be all of the ministries. This is a huge camp meeting. It's at uh, um, that, that center in Oklahoma in the country there called, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's a luxury hotel, basically just in the middle of nowhere. Um, Lifestyle Centers of America, I think it's what it's called. Lifestyle Center of America. Um, so so it's, it was built by Adventists, you know, independent uh, Adventists uh, built this. Um, and basically it was mothballed, you know, nobody's been using it. So in 2010, uh, you know, they sort of got it ready so that, you know, we could have that camp meeting there. And it was going to be uh, Merritt who, who actually paid for the whole thing. And so Jeff is just one of the ministries there, but all of the ministries are there. And um, 
So when it says all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, right? Um, and there arose another generation. This is now what we see. We see this new generation of in the movement, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So this group is going to, um, in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, um, and then we're going to get to 2014, where the spoilers come in, right? And that's when we're going to have this first major division in the movement. So, so, and we're going to have a number of things here that are going to re relate to uh, Parminder uh, and what he brings into the movement. Um, 2013, that, that's the camp meeting where I was at in Alberta, what we call the Silver Lake Camp Meeting. And, and here they had um, rejected Jeff's message. They were basically saying Jeff was... Uh, a sociopath, narcissist, and um, and they were trying to get people to follow them rather than Jeff. And I only understood that retrospectively once we got to 2014, what they were hinting at. And um, and then we're going to have uh, these verses that talk about the judges that are raised up. Now. This is going to relate to the message of chronology in 2016. This is Stephen and I at um, Arkansas, right? So we're going to be uh, presenting a message of, of chronology. This is going to be raised up, but it's what ends up happening is that uh, uh, Jeff is going to um, recognize the chronology at that time, especially in relation to Ezekiel and its relationship to um, Revelation 9. So he's when I do this presentation where I show this connection, Jeff accepts that, takes the DVD, and distributes it everywhere he goes. 2017 is going to address um, the year in which Samuel Snow's letters are expressed, but also it's going to be when they start to this new organization. And then 2018, that's going to be the time setting uh, that's introduced into the movement 2019 when the judge was dead. Now that in some ways is going to represent um, uh, Jeff because they're going to consider that Jeff is dead, right? Um, and then 2020, we're going to have, of course, the July 18, 2020 prediction. Uh, 2021, 2022, and 2023. So it's going to bring us up to this year. That's that's the way we understood it. And and so when we went through the judges, we found that we could take these symbols that were in e each of the judges, and we could connect them to 9/11 in in various ways. Sometimes back to 1989. Sometimes to September 11, 2001. Sometimes we start at November 9th. 19 uh, or 2019 right but it brings us back to this 9-11 symbol and we can then place these dates in these way marks and and the symbols and the narrative all these things fit very nicely right but that was our premise and we we found that the premise seems to bear out Is, is that clear? Does anybody have questions about that? I think uh, a lot of us here can run with it. But I'm just thinking for those, the others in the group, you know, with, in the movement with like uh, Colin's study group and uh, yeah. Daniel Fontenot and so forth. Yeah, uh, they're not. They're not going to accept. I, I, I would. I, I would struggle to see how they would sort of uh, take on board. Mm -hmm. I agree. The methodology. Right. So, so that's the problem that we're facing. So, first off, they haven't taken the time to look at what we've done, right? 
And so we have to be able to present this to them so that they have an opportunity to see it. Right. But if, if we just started with that, with that methodology, I mean, I don't think that would be the correct way to do it. So, I mean, one is we have to rehearse the history. So we know what happened with July 18th. We know how on December 26th or December 6th, 2020, FFA rejected the symbolic use of dates. And, and so we, we have to recognize that we've been going through a history. I mean, we could take the position that, you know, since July 18th, we shouldn't be looking at any dates, any significance in spans of time. We should just be going back to uh, the message that Jeff taught prior to uh, even Parminder coming in, right? So there are people who want to lean towards what Jeff taught in the past and say, all of this, this symbolic use of dates and numbers, we need to abandon, right? Then there's another group that's going to take, um, you know, sort of sit on the fence a bit more. That is, they're going to take some of the dates leading up to July 18th, but they're not going to see any significance in, let's say, December 25th, 2021, right? That, that is, they're not addressing it. So, so they might just accept as an idea, we had this date, um, it was meant to be, we needed to warn Nashville, but nothing happened and we shouldn't be looking really at any dates past that. And then we have people who are, are taking um, the dates, the chronologies and using them sometimes correctly, but sometimes incorrectly. That is, they don't, um, they don't have a framework based upon the lines in which to see the significance of the dates. That is, they have the dates, they recognize dates, the dates are correct, the spans of time are correct, the symbols attached to them are correct. But unless we have a framework based upon the prophetic structure to connect all of this together, then we don't know what those dates mean, right? So the huge thing that we have found in this study has to do with the way that we can confirm 9-11 by its connection to April 5th, 2030, right? So this connection, this comes from the story of Ezra 7 to 10. This is the primary way in which we can understand um, our history is the history in 457 BC, right? So that piece of the puzzle um, shows up, you know, as we went through the book of Joshua, of course, uh, but also through the book of Judges. And we kept being pointed to this structure of this 354 months. So, So I don't know, you know, I don't know the simplest way to present all of this information. But the first thing is we have to understand it well enough ourselves so that we can we can explain it on different levels. And, and I don't know if I even understand it, even though I've spent so much time on it, uh, to know how to simplify it. So if we go back to Judges 1.1, one, one, um, we can see here, we're, we're reading through, uh, we can see that we have these symbols that relate the 10,000 men is going to relate as a symbol. And this number shows up in other places. And it's going to show the conquest of the land. Um, so this is going to be after the death of Joshua. But in chapter two, it's going to talk about after the death of Joshua. So how do we, how do we place chapter one? How do we address what chapter one is about? Because we seem to understand chapter two, that it relates from 9-11 onward. Now, Judges 1-1 one, one gives us the symbol the first day of the first month. But do we address this in some other way? 
are we going to say that Judges 1 is addressing the empowerment of the first message, though with the symbol of the first day of the first month attached to it? Which to me seems kind of contradictory because the first day of the first month should be the arrival of the second, not the empowerment of the first. <clears throat> Okay, so let, let's go on and read chapter one again. So we started here about these different tribes that are going to be conquering. And, um, and these are the ones that are left in the land, right? Now, the first one that's going to go, that's going to be mentioned here is Judah and Simeon. Come up with me into my lot that we may fight against the Canaanites. And likewise, I will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon and Judah are going to work together. Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they slew in them Bezek, 10,000 men. And they found Adon Adonai Bezek, that's the Lord of Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, three score and ten kings, um, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gather their meat under my table as I have done. So God hath requited me, and they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. So we, we never really address this too much in detail. But Adonai Bezek, he's going to be pursued. He gets his thumbs and his, and, and his big toes cut off. And then he says, 70 kings, having their thumbs and great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. So this is referring to what he had done to someone else first. Or what is he talking about? Because he says, as I have done, so have, so God hath requited me or repaid me. Yes, he, uh, he had done this here previously. Yes, to 70 kings. So we have the symbol of the 70. And um, so what's the 70 represent? What does the Adonai Bezek represent? What is... Uh, Judges chapter 1 talking about in relationship to our movement. So we never really address that in detail. Anybody? Anybody have ideas on how we would address this? Okay, so it, it's been a while since we went over this. So why, <clears throat> as we're looking at this with Adonai Bezek, mm -hmm. he makes his comment how he had done this to three score and 10, right? Yep, 70. And then when he is pursued, they caught him and did the same thing to him. Yep. Does this have any interrelation to what we were looking at with Gideon? Okay, explain. How many sons of Gideon were there? 70. So we have the symbol of the 70 kings. We have the symbol of the 70 sons. But... Of these 70, we have their toes and thumbs that are cut off. Right. Now, why would they do that? Well, it uh, makes them unable to fight. It, 
it makes it so they cannot hold a sword in their hand. Yeah. But why their toes? Well, you, you can't run. Well, you can't right? run. Not very well. You're also unstable when you walk. Yeah. Now, uh, Bezek is mentioned, of course, in Judges 1 here. But it's also mentioned in 1 Samuel 11, 8. So, um, so 11, 8 is what? The 11th day of the 8th month. That's August 11th, right? Copy them. Okay. And uh, the interesting thing here is the symbols of the number. And when he numbered them in Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah, 30,000. So here we have the symbol of the 300 and the 30. Right? So what you're talking about with Gideon. Correct. We also have, yeah, we also have at this year time, when when the tabernacle was set up, you had the men of Ephraim uh, going to Joshua and remonstrating with him, complaining that they hadn't got enough land. Yeah. Okay. So, my understanding that was be around the time when the tabernacle was set up. Okay. You know, they divide the land by lot. Yeah. So the tabernacle is actually set up in the Ephraim. And yeah. then you have Elm White, yeah, Elm White Coat, then you have a few hundred years attached to that. Yeah. So and that, then, yeah. Okay. It's in Shiloh. And then, years. yeah. So we know the story of Gideon that mm -hmm. after the 300 uh, defeat the Midianites, you have Ephraim remonstrating with him. Why he why Ephraim wasn't invited? So you have Ephraim again there connected to that three hundred, and then in Judges eleven twenty six, mm -hmm. you have the three hundred years being mentioned, and then after uh, Jephthah defeats the Ammonites, you have Ephraim then uh, yes coming against them. So we have we have this here three hundred uh, connected to Ephraim complaining. Mm -hmm remonstrating with someone yes no and, and the ephraim motif that arises again and again um it, it sort of happens in a progressive way right till finally ephraim is defeated in war so, so under gideon they're just going to be you know uh, complaining and and he's going to calm them right so that, that's another thing that we still haven't fully addressed is how we look at this Ephraim, what it represents. I mean, we know that it represents this movement in some way. Uh, the worries, worrisome thing there is it shows that, that the movement gets more and more progressively opposed to the message so that it ends up in all out war, you know, not literally, but symbolically. Um, so, so with here with First Samuel eleven verse eight. So, Stephen, you would see this as significant as relating to um, August eleventh, eighteen forty, as being the empowerment, and that would agree with the idea that chapter one is dealing with nine eleven as the empowerment of the first angel. Would that make sense to you? Um, it's a bit tentative. Okay. It was tentative. Oh. Now, and in this story here, this is when Saul defeats the Ammonites, right? So this is going to be um, connected with the four hundred years that Alan White talks about, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and, th and that's one of the, the keys to the chronology that we have from the spirit of prophecy that would uh, agree with the 480 years of 1 Kings 6 verse 1. So it helps um, 
And this is what, in the second year of Saul? Is that where we placed it? Yeah, it's, it is early. I think uh, Elle might, uh, she mentions in the second year. Uh, yeah. But that, that occurred. Yeah. So, although, the, although, was it, or, although, maybe that was the Philistines. No. No, no, it was about no. the Am Ammonites. The children right, okay. of Ammon, right? The 400 years of the children of Ammon, that, that, that was delayed. So we go from um, uh, the, the book of Deuteronomy, the date given in the book of Deuteronomy, and we count uh, 400 years. And that brings us to here, right? So, so anyway, it fits in then with the fourth fourth year of Solomon, as being for the four hundred and eighty years uh, from when they crossed the Jordan. So it fits into that history. <clears throat> so, so the point is when we go back to um, Judges 1, and we start looking at this history, it's going to tie us to symbols that bring us to 9-11 uh, as being a symbol of the empowerment of the first angel. Um, so I don't understand Angela's chat comment. Multiple of Ks, what are Ks? Oh, that's thousands. I just, I was looking at the thousand and the 10,000. And then of course I thought of the song, you know, they, that tri triumphal song, Saul is slain as thousands and David is 10,000s. Okay. And then you go to First Kings 18 verse seven. Sorry, I meant First Samuel. I have a problem with mixing those okay. books up. Okay, First Samuel 18, verse 7. Sorry. That's the one where the woman answered one, one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Okay, that makes more sense. Right. And, and we can see, of course, that's where the jealousy of Saul arises. Now, we haven't got to Samuel and... Um, that history yet studying the books of samuel uh, which we're going to find a lot of things there when we get to samuel that relate to our lines um because it's that history is going to parallel our history now uh, dwight had done presentations back in uh, 2020 at in at um uh in arkansas relating to that Right, understanding of Saul and David. Correct, Dwight? I'm trying to remember, to be honest. Well, you were you were applying it to this movement, what was happening in this movement, but okay. I, I don't think it was appreciated like both in the intellectual sense and in the emotional sense by, by um, those at FFA. That is, they knew you were talking about them. Um, I don't know if you even knew you were talking about them, though. Um, yeah, I'd have I'd have to go back over my notes. Yeah, and but but it was about the opposition to uh, the message that was happening within the movement, and I don't think you realized it was going to be FFA itself that would oppose it. But right. anyway, it, it related to what was happening in the movement at the time. Um, but I don't think, you know, I could only understand it retrospectively. At the time, I wasn't really sure until afterwards <clears throat> how it applied. But we're going to see that again. So, um, so we're going to have this story with uh, uh, Judah, right? And um, they're going to take over. Uh, they're going to fight against the Canaanites. And then in Judges 1, verse 8, now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem and had taken it and smitten it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. So remember, this is a Jebusite fortification 
They never really fully conquer this until David. Right? Correct. Yeah. Um, so it says, afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain and in the south and in the valley. And Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now, the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. Um, and uh, that word Arba, I know it has refers to the number uh, four, I believe. Um, but uh, let me see here. Kirjith just means the city of Arba. Of course, Kirjith is a city. Uh, it's one of the Anakims, but it means the number four, right? So it's it also refers to uh, one of the Anakim. So he's named the four. Um, <clears throat> um, and they slew Sh Sheshai, Ahiman, and Talmai. So these are going to be um noble my brother is a gift and talmai means furrowed so whatever those means those mean or how we would apply it um yeah noble my brother is a gift and furrowed so these are the children of anik right Anakin. So this is going to be in Hebrew. And from thence they went against the inhabitants of Deber. Uh, so these are Amorites. And the name of, of Deber before was Kirjath Sefer. So that's the city of the book, right? So Sefer means writings or book. Okay, so this is going to be Judah and Simeon, right? And Caleb said, he that smiteth uh, Kirjath Sefer and taketh it to him, I will give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. So this story here, dealing with Caleb, um, it's also in the book of Joshua, right? And we had dealt with that before in the book of Joshua. So that's going to be chapter 15. So it's, it's way back there, right? Now, so they talk about it in the book of Joshua, right? So here in the book of Judges, they're reiterating some of this history. Why are they reiterating it? Why are they repeating uh, this history? Why are they talking about it? A reminder to all on this base what we're standing on on the old paths, the foundations okay. of old. Yeah, so part of what we look at when we look at the judges is we, we recognize the first thing that this movement did after, not exactly the first thing, but one of the first things we did after July 18th is we examined the foundation. So first we looked at, you know, Acts 27, and then we looked at, uh, the 2520, and then we began a study on examining the foundation. And the study on examining the foundation, um, uh, the significance uh, in that study is that we're re reviewing all of the history, all of what Jeff had taught, um, to understand that the foundation was laid correctly. And in doing so, we also study the foundation in Millerite history. And we see that we made the same mistakes, so to speak, as the Millerites did in, in drawing some of our conclusions. But God was still leading the Millerites and God was still leading us. So, so the parallel is, is a perfect parallel in that sense. So now they're going to go back to this story of Caleb. And that's because... Um, why? Why do they want to go to this? Why are they bringing up this particular story? So it's going to be Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. 
Now, we understand this then. Othniel is um, when we get to Judges chapter 3, is this the same Othniel? It, it is, right? I would think it would have to be. Yeah, well, it is. It does say it's Caleb's younger brother. So we're going to have the same Othniel as the first judge. And this is going to be a, after uh, the this period of eight years of Kushath, Kushan Rishathayim that's going to be um, oppressing the children of Israel. So, so we're being brought back to this story because I believe, because we need to know this history of Oth, Othniel. I've been uh, looking at the uh, we've had a chronology there concerning Othniel and Caleb. Yeah. And uh, Caleb, or sorry, Othniel, he's, he was born just before the, uh, the Exodus. Yeah, just before they they yeah so he was he was uh a lot younger than uh caleb i think uh, yes he would have to be a lot younger i think at least 45 years yeah and um because there was only those other than caleb and joshua there was only the children the little ones who were between Zero and nineteen years that actually crossed uh, into the promised land. Yeah. Um, but there was also the an issue was well, one of the commentators brought up the issue of if uh, Caleb was his younger brother and he was marrying his daughter. Well, that was going against the Levitical uh, command that the 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 uncles were not to marry. Niece, uh, their, their nieces. So I don't know if we addressed that there. Kind of. A... Well, do, don't they have different mothers? Well, there was a there was that says that also he was the son of Kenev. And then uh, Caleb, he was the son of Jephanua. So there's some debate whether it's the mother or... So, well, some people take out, well, that's just different fathers. Maybe but, different uh, fathers. But uh, Jephanua was a cousin. Yeah. So uh, they were all related to the Kenev. So it's maybe just saying that Othniel, uh, it's not going to his directly to his father, it's maybe going to just his lineage, you know, to his maybe his grandfather. Yeah. Um, someone before. So that there could be that they had the same father. Um yeah. But you know they could have been like, you know, stepbrothers or something too. Whatever, however that was done. Well I would imagine so if there's going to be such a great age difference uh, between them. You know, I wouldn't think that if the mother had Caleb when she was maybe a teenager, you know, she would have been well. It might have been like a miraculous birth, you know, for the mother then to have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so the Bible doesn't give us any clear way to sort that out. Um, but I don't think there's a problem with Othniel uh, taking. Uh, Caleb's daughter. Mm -hmm. Right. So, however that however that occurs, um, but this is yeah. Othniel. This is what he's he's going to do. So Othniel in um, in this story here, uh, where is this? So he gets Axa, 
um, the daughter of Caleb. He gets Axa as his wife. Now, there's going to be this whole story dealing with, um, it came to pass when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted from off her ass. And Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? And he said unto him, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law. So we know that um, uh, this is actually, uh, what, what did we decide that this was actually um, not the father-in-law? This is a different relationship. Anyway, went up out of the city of a palm tree. So we're here we're going to have the, the city of palm trees refers to Jericho, which is going to give us the 2520 as a symbol. And the children of Judah went into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad. And they went and dwelt among the people. And Judah went, all, went with Simeon, his brother, and they slew the Canaanites. So... Um, So what's happening here? What's the significance of this land, the upper springs and the nether springs? Why is AXA asking for this? What, what is the significance of this story? I think I said we really have to the, the ladder, and for, the former and the ladder in. Yeah, well, we did that. So why why this story? Why is this story here? Well, I think it shows no impartiality. I mean, it shows no partiality with God that He's willing to bless females as well as males. That's part of it. And there are no males to inherit inherit the territory, so the women were okay. involved. Yeah. So that's 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 part of the story. But I'm talking about more symbolically, in connection with this um how we're going to understand it in this time i think that lighting off her ass means that there's something referring to islam here right so there's something referring to islam we also have the 20 25 20 being referred to and the former and the latter rain being referred to So is this giving us symbols that relate to our line and the repeat of history? Now, we also have the symbol of the 16th day of the first month there in Judges 1.16. Say that that symbol there is tied to that verse. So there's a lot of things that, you know, as we've gone through these lines, studying these lines here in connection specifically with judges, but even um, with the book of Joshua and earlier, we've made lots of applications of these symbols the verses, the Hebrew numbers for words, uh, any number um, has tied us symbolically to our history, to the symbols of our history. Um, so when we have this story, um, of Aska, right? She's going to be in, in verse 13 that she's mentioned. And then in verse 14, 
she's going to ask, she's going to inquire of her father. So she's going to ask of Caleb. She's going to ask for this field when she lights from off her ass. So, you know, he asked, what do you want, right? And she said, give me a blessing for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Now this upper and nether springs, we, we say it represents the former and the latter rain. What, what specifically is she receiving? Do we know? So when we look at this story, we have to look at um, So we're going to have this story of the upper and other springs. So this is according to a, a commentary here, just that this is um, not just wells, um, but these are um, a district in the mountains and another district in the valley that's well watered. Uh, Okay. And any any thoughts on this? I know I'm reading. So we have all, all these symbols together. We have this ass. We have um, the former and the latter rain. We're going to use that as a symbol. We have the 2520, we have City of Palm Trees. Curious what the Southland means. Well, this is the area um, around Hebron, right? So it's south of Jerusalem, it's in the southern part. Um, now, how did we understand the South previously? when we are looking at the dividing of the land. So that's, the word here south is Negev. That's the desert area. So that's, that's the reason why she needs this uh, water. She needs springs of water. Right. And of course, this is well, going to be where Judah is. If this is Hebron. Yeah, it's by it's Hebron it. and Deber, right? So those are conquered, and she asked for land in that area. But it's That's not really particularly. What's that? Desert. It's not really known as desert land. It's just going towards the desert, but I don't think it's the. I wouldn't describe it as desert territory unless it's definitely well, they're, not they're, the Yeah. So, well, the word Southland is Negev, right? Which is the desert. That's just another word for desert. It means parched, right? So she's going to be south there of Hebron, Deber, uh, those areas, right? but he's going to give her springs of water. 
-hmm. Okay, so how do we relate this symbolically to our movement? Do, do we have any way in which we can understand whose AXA is, how Othniel, why Othniel, uh, and AXA are connected? How does this relate? These studies the springs of water. Are these studies the springs of water? Right. Well, yes, because we know that the former and latter rain are messages. Right. So, so we have the upper springs and the nether springs. So these would have so, messages. So the upper springs would be the former rain the latter springs would be the latter ring. <clears throat> that, that's how we're taking it, yeah. Yeah, so the Negev is south of Hebron and um, so that's quite a bit south, uh, south of Beersheba, Beersheba. So it's south of Beersheba, the well of the oath. I'm just looking at a map. So that's an area in Judah. Now, this is going to be Othniel. So Othniel is going to be the first judge. What did Othniel represent? As a judge. He's going to come after 9-11, right? And Othniel is addressing, he's the Holy Spirit, right? He's representing the work of the Holy Spirit. Of convicting us of our sins. So, do the messages of the former and the latter reign come in connection with 9 11? We would have to say yes. That's what Jeff taught, right? Yes. Okay, Correct. and and we can see that Othniel here is mentioned in chapter one. He's also going to be the, the first judge in chapter three. And we're saying that chapter one is representing this message in relation to 9-11 being the empowerment of the first angel. So this is that history of this movement relating to everything that leads up to 9-11. Because 911 is the empowerment of the first angel. And that's going to lead to the understanding of, of, of you know, we have, they lighted off the ass. She lights off the ash, ass. So is this movement recognizing 911 as, as August 11th, 1840? Is that what this history is about? So we have this, this history that's going to be connected to 9-11, also as the, the arrival of the second angel. But first, it has to be recognized as the empowerment of the first angel. We have to defeat this, 
these enemies, right? So first they're going to conquer the land. This is talking about when they conquer the land first, right? And so when we read, because I'm just trying to finish this off, we just got a few minutes, right? So this is going to talk about that whole history. And then it's going to talk about the failure to complete the conquest. Right? So they're not going to complete the conquest. And then we're going to deal with um, Ephraim. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. That's verse 29. The dwelling Gezer, but the Canaanites dwelt in Gezer among them. And neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalal, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries, right? And neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor of Alab, nor of Aksid, nor of Helba, nor of Afik, Afik, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Bethanath, right, the house of Anath, right? And he, but he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Bethanath became tributaries unto them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell among Herez in Agilon and in Shalbim, and in the hand of the house of Joseph, prevailed so that they became tributaries. And the coast of the Amorites, from the going up of Akrabim, from the rock and upward. Right. So we can see that these enemies are in the land. And chapter 2 is going to tell us at the beginning, starting with 2001, 9-11, talking about how we are not to make a league, right? And, um, but that those enemies are left in the land. So in verse three, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be thorns in your sides and their God shall be a snare unto you. So this is what this movement has been addressing dealing with Adventism, but also within the movement itself, right? That is the whole point that we've seen in studying the book of Judges. Correct? We can see the condition of this movement, that the enemies, Agreed. the teachings that we received as Seventh-day Adventists, the things that we have to unlearn, they have affected this movement. And we've seen that a dog returns to its vomit and a pig to its wallowing in the mire. The people who have left this movement, where do they go? Back to the church or back to the world? Right, back to the church or back to the world. Correct. So, so these messages, whether they're going to be accepted, you know, going back to what Stephen says, I think that many people in this movement will not accept what we've come to understand. First off, many won't even look at it. But we have to believe and trust that God has a purpose and that those that are meant to understand these things will come to understand them. The big problem, you know, that we, we all have with this is we would like to things see things just finished up quickly. But we recognize there's so much work to accomplish and that in order to accomplish that work, um, this movement has to be united. Right. We're not accomplishing the work right now. We're studying. We're doing what we're supposed to do. But this isn't just studies for interest sake. This is study so that we can know what actions we are to take and to move forward in accomplishing the tasks that God has assigned to us. And that's why I think this camp meeting coming up is important.
because this movement right now is on the brink. I mean, it's been, has been for a long time. Now, I'm just going by human sight. I don't see how this movement can survive. Right. There's too much internal criticism. Too many people pulling in different directions because we're not connected with Christ. And so we have to be. Any final thoughts before we close? So I hope people can see how it's important that we understand these two chapters and how they relate to how we have understood and interpreted the rest of the book of Judges. And I still feel like there's much that we're missing. But you know, we've come a long way before we started studying the book of Judges. But it's, it's been a long time, right? So, and we've been putting hours and hours and hours into it. But there's still more that God has to show us. Okay. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here this morning. And uh, we pray for the study tomorrow night and, and the studies on Sabbath and, and Sunday. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that you can continue uh, to lead and guide us. Help us to sort through these things individually to search these things out and um, help us to see things clearly. Be with each person. May your angels watch over them today. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.